My name is Olaf, and I play guitars and keyboards for a Swedish metal band Amaranth. First of all, I want to congratulate you uh, regarding the album, The Catalyst. Really awesome album. Favorite song, my favorite song, uh, The Catalyst, of course, but um, liberated and insatiable. This two songs, like my favorites. Like these three songs are my favorite. So, first question you, you did so many interviews, right? Everybody asked you about the album. So, I'm not afraid not to cover the album, but uh, I noticed that uh, nobody asked you how many songs didn't go into the album. Yeah. So that's a, it's an interesting question because the way that me and Lise writes music, we don't necessarily finish uh, the songs until uh, a little bit before we go into the studio. So usually it's uh, embryos and ideas that then later grows into fully fledged songs. So we would typically write vocal lines, chord progressions on guitar or keyboard. And then you have the skeleton of a song. The way that I see it is that a, um, a great song can be played in uh, on any instrument together with the vocals or in, even in any genre if you know that the um, vocal lines work really well. So to answer the question, I would say 40 ideas. Uh, 40 so, uh, okay, a lot of ideas that they've got. Yeah, what happens to those ideas? Do they wait for their own uh, life in the future uh, albums or are they just a good idea that you can reuse somehow for singles or maybe for other projects? Actually, we have never used an old idea ever, which is a little bit of a shame because there are some, there are some really fantastic stuff there. Well, you could keep them in the world, like Prince, you know, and maybe someday, you know, like keep them in the back. It's fine. Yeah, I mean, you, you never know. Maybe, you know, something would fit. But the, the way that I like to see it is that uh, as you mature as a composer and a musician and you're as a person as well, your pers perspectives tend to, to change. And so when you're writing for a new album, you want that to represent where you're at, at your career and, you know, in your personal life, basically. So not so far, but um, there are some songs that we completed for the, for the first album. I haven't really talked much about this. I should be careful what I'm saying, but um, let's say that there were four or five songs that were actually completed with the whole uh, setup, but not recorded for the first album. So that could be kind of cool because it's a time document for, you know, for times past, basically. So maybe, you know, one day for the 15th anniversary, 20th, who knows? Well, who knows? You can always put them in as a, as a separate album that didn't come out. I mean, uh, the, it's endless. And it's good that you're putting it all in the world because uh, if it's flowing in your head and it's flowing, you feel it. So why should you stop it? Let that rest for the future, right? Exactly. Okay, so you mentioned one thing is that uh, it's a certain uh, time snap of your life at a certain point, the album, right? Have you noticed uh, the development in your personal creative way, how it was like developing throughout the albums? I mean, <clears throat> certainly, because they are, uh, as you say, they're snapshots of where you were at, you know, at that point. While even with the first album, we were really happy with the genre and the style that we had kind of, you know, uh, I would like to say created almost because it was a very weird combination of genres, especially at the time. So um, it, it's a little bit of both in the sense that already, you know, 14 years ago, we, we were very sure what we wanted to do. And I tried, to, you know, as much as possible to stay true to that vision, because uh, like any really, really good band, I think, does that, you know, even if you have this evolution, and uh, there are some extreme examples where you have uh, bands that have changed very little, like ACDC or Iron Maiden or something like that, which are fantastic bands. So obviously we, we like to innovate, you know, quite a bit for every album, but we like the core to remain the same. And, the, you know, the innovation part is always a reflection of, you know, your perspectives on life, what you, the kind of music that you listen to and everything in between. Yeah, so the catalyst was the catalyst of, of all of the stuff. But you, you mentioned in the other interviews, uh, the album, right? So it's a development of your personal stuff. Yes, the vision. That's really important because you are the band with their own sound. You know, even if you go on uh, Wikipedia and check what's the genres, it's like a list of huge genres, which is a sign. It's their own genre, right? You, you can't just you, you describe it as a name, the, the, the name of the band, right? So how come it's really hard for artists to find their own voice, right? It takes years, right? Uh, what was in your case? How did you know what you want? Because not like, it's not easy. I mean, I think um, everyone in the band has a very eclectic taste in music. So we listen to a lot of uh, different styles of music. And 
for me personally, the background that I come from is, uh, it's very shaped by classical music. And I think I, I studied it a lot and I played, uh, you know, piano, violin and, you know, all that yes. stuff. Yes. But I think, um, I think with Amaranth, I wanted to step away from that. So I was consciously stepping outside the comfort zone. So I think that that's one of the first things that is really important is that if you just sit completely within your comfort zone, it's just going to be really, really difficult to define yourself musically because it's uh, your comfort zone. Yeah, you might think that this is where you're going to do your best things, but it might be the other way around in a way. And uh, secondly, um, I mean, working together with Elise writing music, obviously she has a very eclectic taste in music as well. So um, what we did was uh, I based it very much upon my upbringing with Gothenburg uh, melodic death metal. So that's more of the comfort zone. So, of course. And then you have all these pop influences with modern pop, you know, from actually not only modern pop, but everything from, you know, the 90s or even the 80s forwards to uh, to current things that are happening in pop music. Like we let keep a completely open mind and let all those things inspire us. And Elise is an expert when it comes to this. And the thing is that it's not a secret, but people don't always realize how much of an influence pop music has been on hard rock music for the last 40, 40 50 years. And people don't always want to realize it, even with the really heavy bands have all these influences because that's where the big choruses come from. And, you know, some people will admit it less than, less than others. But we just wanted to take it to uh, the logical, almost end conclusion. Like, what if you make it really extreme on both sides? And then, and then it works. I think it works. It totally, the, the, the album and the whole band is like, it's, it's a, as I said, it's a success. You have the, your own sound. Well, you mentioned that you also wanted to do the symphony. You did the symphony, right? You composed, or not yet, or no, not yet. But I mean, uh, something orchestral uh, yeah. on, on, yeah, on a grander scale, that would be very cool to do, also with the band. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, there has been some conversations about it. I can't really say too much. That's something that's going to happen, you know, longer into the future if it happens. I might underline because we're always a busy band. You know, it's always about the next step. And so on and so forth. That's that's something that I've been lately sneaking into, uh, into putting us more, more yeah. and more, more influence. Yeah. Oh, a combination of pop, a little bit pop metal and symphony, more good, heavy. Yeah. When we're talking, about, we need to define when we're talking about symphony and orchestral stuff. Uh, is it more like a classical influence? Yeah, I mean, it can be anything from film score music to, uh, to classical music and uh, any way that you could use an orchestra, basically. But um. I mean, to do it, to do it live with a full, you know, piece orchestra, if it's possible and if we have the time, that would be a dream come true. Do you have a favorite uh, composer, 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 classical or film score or something like this? Because usually people ask you about the metal stuff and other bands, but what about the classical uh, um, composers? Well, yeah, I, several. Depends a little bit on what uh, what perspective. Because uh, first of all, I really like the uh, the older. Um, melodic uh, baroque music like uh, Vivaldi and Bach and you know this kind of thing and obviously we are in Vienna so I have to mention Mozart as well naturally uh, I've been to the Mozart house here in Vienna pl plenty of times also no time for sightseeing today unfortunately but um, and then let's say more modern stuff from Gustav Holst to uh, Anton Schoenberg which was mm -hmm. yeah. also living here in Vienna so uh, which is really really interesting and then with, when it comes to contemporary classical music, can be very, very, very interesting as well. It's a lot more difficult to digest, and it's more about the ideas than harmony and melodies, I could even say. But um, there's some really in interesting stuff there, such as Pact and so on. Uh, do you sometimes deconstruct uh, s some pieces that you like the most, you know, to understand how it's made and why it's working? Because sometimes you don't understand it, just the feeling is good. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's uh, when it comes to classical music, it's different because it's uh, very often based upon uh, things that you can define, mm -hmm. especially from the 17 and the 1800s. Then you can see that there are certain modulations, there are certain chord progressions, and there is um, different ways to work with harmony that was established as a rule as soon as uh, you know the rules were broken. Yes, then the rules got updated. Basically, it's more more difficult when it comes to pop and rock music because it's based more on intuition and theory. But I. Love to break down songs and see why simple songs work. I think this is maybe the most interesting thing because this is about uh, the emotional connection in a, let's say, classic rock song, uh, I don't know, or a pop song from a band like Rock Set or ABBA. Yes, you covered Rock Set. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So this, uh, just as an example, uh, we um, we did a cover of uh, Feeling Like a Flower, 
by Roxette. And for me, it was really interesting to re-record the thing because then I could, meanwhile, analyze to see what it is that makes the song tick. Actually, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Hemingway, well, I mean, Hunter S. Thompson, the writer, was retyping, retyping physically Hemingway. Hemingway was doing it the same way mm -hmm. things to understand the flow, the, 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 the rhythm, the tempo, the words to understand. So basically it's the same approach. You do the cover and you understand it at the same time how it's been done, right? Yeah, it's exactly like that. I mean, from the orchestral point of view, again, like uh, the intro for tonight's yeah. show that you're going to hear is heavily inspired by uh, John Williams and very consciously so as well. So there's a bit of Star Wars and even more Indiana Jones in there just to set the mood, you know, for the show. And then it goes into the more uh, electronical realm. And that was a fantastic way to just like, get a little bit, uh, a few minutes in the head of John Williams to see how he approaches orchestration. And it's a really good method uh, to, to learn how to uh, like to just pick things apart. That's also one I did when I was a kid, you know, with In Flames, yeah. who were also from uh, from Gothenburg. And yeah. um, I even got to jam with the In Flames guys when I was 16 years old. So that was a good way to get into their head space and try to, you know, figure out what it is that makes the band tick. Sure. Still a phenomenal band. Did you did it something surprise you back then uh, with In Flames when, when you were jamming with, when playing with them? Like uh, something that, uh, like maybe something was unusual, maybe uh, that just surprised you or just the whole experience for you was magical? I would say the, um, the the thing is that they have several different pretty simple parts that uh, come together and forms uh, a unity and it, that's it's a little bit unusual at least for me especially at the time compared to like thrash metal bands like Metallica for example then you usually have the one riff that is driving and then you have drums and bass to back that up and then you have the vocals that go on top after the riff is written What's really cool with the Inflames music is that, for example, with this melodic death metal, is that there's a lot of different parts that are, you cannot play them by yourself because then they are meaningless without the other guitar player putting the harmony and the general harmonical context of it. And then you have the bass playing something else and there might be, you know, several layers of harmony on top of that on guitars. So it's some pretty sophisticated stuff. I see that you have a, a fascination with... Uh, um the the magic of simplicity <clears throat> absolutely is it uh, uh can i dare to say that sometimes it's easy to hide b behind the complexity and just to keep noise and it's harder to make something simple and effective i mean it's ex exactly like that i mean as a songwriter that's kind of what you're looking for you're looking for something that is just intuitively going to to hit people emotionally and uh, the way that you define simplicity, because I mean, you can do that with some really complex stuff also, because um, it's just going to reach the person in a little bit of a different way, I think. And then again, everyone has, I mean, music is subjective, so everyone has different tastes. But I think for these really, really, you know, timeless classics that every songwriter is kind of looking for, then it's it's usually the simpler, the better. And then you, you can make a really complex arrangement and you can put a ton of the stuff on top of it. But if you don't have the core idea, you basically don't have anything. I mean, I can be even impressed by bands who do, I won't say bad songs, but maybe not great songs, but they make amazing arrangements with really, really good musicianship. That's still going to be impressive, but it's just not going to have that X factor, if you know what I mean. And I'm not saying that I uh, achieved that in you know any, any way. It's just, it's rather the goal. It's what you're looking for. But I can see it in other people's music when they have you know, achieve this according to my taste, of course. Yeah, of course, of course. What do you think about Taylor Swift? Fantastic to songwriting. I mean, you have uh, Max Martin, um, sweet guy, yeah. yes, who used to be in a metal band yeah. called Masquerade, yeah. and uh, I mean, he's responsible for like all the way back to as people know in the '90s, you know, with Britney Spears and Backstreet Boys. And the, the funny thing is that if you actually go back and listen to the songs, they are. Def Leppard songs or something like that that are just rearranged into pop music. Uh -huh. Like if you listen to the Hysteria album All right. and then you compare it to uh, Britney Spears, Oops, I Did It Again, you will see where the emphasis come from. And this is what he says himself, so it's not something that I'm making up, but I could hear it already before. And uh, and then he continued to write music throughout, you know, what is it, three and a half decades now? Three. Almost. And he managed to reinvent himself and... Um, even if it changes the sound and, you know, pop music changes with almost every year, 
the call remains the same. Great songs, really good melodies and um, really good arrangements. Then I would say Taylor Swift is probably not something I listen to a lot myself personally, but I can really appreciate the craftsmanship of the songwriting behind it for sure. Great. I mean, I ask uh, regarding the Taylor Swift because everybody has an opinion uh, regarding Taylor Swift. Okay. So, uh, yes, yes. Uh, all right. We don't have much time. Don't want to bother you too much. So what's the plan right now? We finished the tour. Are you already, um, d did you compose more uh, music that's coming up in the, in the near future? Let's say it like this. We had the three and a half years, roughly speaking, almost four years between Manifest and The Catalyst. And we don't intend to have the same amount of time in between now yeah. because obviously uh, the pandemic, the band got a bit of downtime. We got to, you know, rethink, replan, restructure, reorganize, all that, all that fun stuff. But now we, we feel that we have a good momentum and we have a ton of inspiration, you know. So um, I would say, you know. I know how you compose. You can compose in one year. I'm pretty sure you can like, you can make new music uh, in the next year, especially you have like motivation and full steam ahead, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I always have inspiration. It needs always have inspiration. So uh, why stop? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, perfect. All right. Uh, which song should I put at the end uh, of the interview of Amar uh, as a good introduction to the band? The Catalyst from the album, The Catalyst. Mm -hmm. 